My name is Andy Jones. I'm the CEO of Ramsey here in the UK. Ramsey Healthcare is a global provider of healthcare. We operate in 11 countries, employing 77,000 staff. And incredibly, we look after over 8 million patients a year. Ramsey Healthcare has been here in the UK for the last 12 years. We've now become the number one provider for NHS services, which means that GPs are able to choose Ramsey Hospitals to refer their patients for high quality healthcare. So Ramsey has got a long-standing set of values called the Ramsey Way. They really define who we are as an organisation, how we work together, how we look after patients, and ultimately it's all about people caring for people. We're very proud of the services that we provide, and that's largely due to teamwork and our staff. The difference that this makes for patients is really high quality healthcare in all of our hospitals and facilities. We've got an absolutely fantastic programme called Speaking Up for Safety. It's all about training staff to be positive and to call out episodes in patients' care, particularly when they're concerned that things aren't going right. We've been able to grab this programme and we're the first organisation in the UK to roll this programme out. The future for Ramsey Healthcare is bright both globally and for us here in the UK. All of our units are accredited for endoscopy. The Care Quality Commission has rated 92% of our hospitals as good and 95% of our patients would recommend us to their friends and family. We're a leader in day case surgery. We've looked at the way that our hospitals are designed so that we can treat ever more patients in today's healthcare. The future of healthcare is all about partnerships and integrating the patient journey. At Ramsey, this means we need to be working very closely with all our partners, including the NHS, to make sure that our services are available in all the communities that our hospitals serve. Over time, I can see the company both growing and expanding in the reach of its services. But for me, most of all, patient safety and quality come first. Simply put, people caring for people. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Lecture of Distinction, very kindly sponsored by Ramsey Healthcare. Uh, my name is Tim Williams and I'm one of their hosts and your moderator for tonight. Um, as per the usual format, it's going to feature a half an hour lecture and tonight's subject is paediatric foot and ankle uh, problems. It'll be followed by some case-based discussions and the opportunity for questions and answers with our speaker tonight. Please put any questions through the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and I'll try and put them through to our speaker uh, in due course. Um, we really value your feedback, and therefore, um, in order to get the CPD points from the Royal College of Surgeons, we would ask that you um, uh, take the feedback code that will be put in the chat function uh, midway through the lecture, and you can use that as a link in order to get through and give us some feedback on the lecture and also then get your, um, your, fee, your certificate of attendance in return. Um, without further ado then, let, let me introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Mr. Krishna Vemulapali is one of our own. He's part of the BOFAS Education Committee and has been a consultant for over 14 years. He specialises in disorders of the adult foot and ankle, but also of the paediatric foot and ankle as well. He's an orthopaedic consultant at Barking and Havering and Regbridge Hospitals, working predominantly at the King George Hospital in Goodmays and the Queen's Hospital in Romford. He also holds an honorary senior lecturer position at Queen Mary University, London. It therefore gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker on paediatric foot deformities, uh, Mr. Krishna Vemulapalli. Welcome, Krishna. Thank you, Tim. Tim, can I ask you, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it perfectly. Well and done, can you. you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Uh, so let's uh, kick start. We are going to talk about pediatric foot. 
And uh, the aims of the talk is very, very simple, to understand the pathophysiology of the condition, to treat the patients with confidence and to reassure the parents with confidence. And of course, we all need to pass the exam. So this is important to understand about the pediatric uh, foot and ankle. Now there are 26 bones, 33 joints, more than 100 ligaments and tendons. We are not going to talk about everything. We, lo uh, we looked at uh, the important topics, what makes you to pass the FRCS exam and also uh, to run your clinic. So we are going to touch base mainly on CTEV uh, uh, and then we will uh, uh, spend some uh, time on uh, uh, congenital vertical talus, tarsal coalitions, which are rigid flat feet and uh, some case discussions. So congenital talipis equinoveris. So what are we going to learn? We are going to learn what exactly it is and uh, we will talk about different kinds of treatments and uh, uh, some literature uh, review. CTEV is commonly called as club foot. Uh, the incidence is one in thousand live birth and CTEV stands for congenital talipes equinoveris there. It can, most of the times it is idiopathic, but it can be because of some kind of uh, 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 neurological problems there. This is one of the very few clinical pathologies which are purely, which is purely diagnosed on the clinic, on a clinical examination. There is no radiological examination to confirm and all those things. So you need to be very, very good at your clinical examination. So when will you call this as CTEV? When there is a, a high, uh, high arch, which is cavus, forefoot is turned inwards, metatarsal adductus, heel is inwards, that is varus deformity, and foot is pointing downwards, that is equinus deformity. And... Uh, 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 this is described as cavus, adductus, varus, and equinus, and the pictures on the screen are self-explanatory. Different kinds of etiology, most often it is uh, genetic, familial, with, uh, with AD, uh, uh, autosomal dominant trait, and sometimes it can be environmental. Before we dwell into the Ponsetti and the the, tr the present treatment, let's uh, have a look at the history. What exactly, uh, how did we come into this position there? Talipis is nothing new. It has been there for uh, thousands of years. These are the pictures which were uh, drawn in the uh, Egyptian uh, pyramids over there. And if we are coming to the west side, these are the Roman uh, pictures over there. And these are the different kinds of instruments which has been uh, uh, used to conceal the deformity or to treat the deformities uh, uh, there. Coming to the 20th century, he, uh, uh, Hugh Thomas has invented uh, uh, this instrument called Thomas Wrench. And he used to acutely reduce the forefoot and uh, talipes with this uh, 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 wrench there. And in some of these, uh, uh, there are different types of traction methods which are shown on the screen. And this is my favorite one, club foot machine, which is used by Phelps. Uh, and uh, you, you try to acutely correct the, uh, the deformity over there. This is from uh, like a circular frame from Italy. And uh, these are from uh, various parts of the world where they, they were using the, these instruments to treat the club foot there. If we are coming to the 21st century, it's not as cruel as 20th century. So we had Kite uh, which, uh, uh, from 1930, Ponsetti 1948 and French 1980. Until 2000 or 1999, we were all treating with acute surgical correction. So what is kite method? This is introduced in 1930 and each component is separately treated, four foot adduction, heel wearers and equinus. It was taking six months of uh, uh, correction and the fulcrum was on calcaneo cuboid joint. Then once the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the first stage is over, 
the calcaneum is everted by placing a slipper cast on a glass plate and forcing it into eversion. Later on, the forefoot was uh, dorsiflexing, forcefully dorsiflex, uh, uh, was brought to the dorsi, uh, uh, dorsiflexion position with wedging. So if you are comparing the kite and Ponsetti treatment, most of them are same. However, the main difference is the calcaneo cuboid joint was used as a fulcrum, whereas in Ponsetti, it was talus. And the second important difference was in, in, in a kite, they were pronating the first ray, whereas in Ponsetti, we are supinating the first ray. So the, the problems with the kite are you are using a, a, a thumb at the calcaneo cuboid joint to use it as a fulcrum. And at the same time, you want to bring the heel into eversion. So you are contradicting yourself. Then you are trying to pronate the first ray, making the cavus deformity very obvious. So that is one of the re some of the reasons why kite uh, um, has very poor results there. So there was no manipulation. There was premature dorsiflexion of the heel and there is counter pressure and trying to, uh, on the calcaneo cuboid joint and then at the same time pulling the heel into eversion. And he was uh, um, uh, suggesting about uh, below knee cast and early short splints over there. Then comes the French method in 1980, which was started by uh, Ben Sahel, but popularized by Demiglio. What does it involve is daily manipulations by the skilled physiotherapist. So five working days out of seven, the, the patients were coming into the hospital, the physiotherapists were doing some uh, manipulations and then applying the sticky plasters. So this is the sticky tapes for six months followed by above knee and below knee AFO plus or minus Achilles uh, tendon problem. The goal is very clear to reduce the telonavicular joint. That is fantastic. That is uh, not at all a problem. Uh, but the problem was, uh, you know, applying the CPM machines when the patient is sleeping. So the reasons why the French method has failed is basically because of the patient has to be brought to the clinic every day. Can you imagine parents bringing the patient to the uh, hospital every day? and every patient was getting CPM machine because they have to use it at home there. And the parents has to participate actively in application of the plasters as well as the exercises. So because of that, the French method has gone out of uh, 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 vogue there. Then comes the Ponsetti. So why should we adapt uh, to the treatment? The reason is because it is good it is reliable, reproducible, simple, cheap, effective, and it is based on a strong anatomical and uh, 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 cadaveric uh, uh, principles over there. It's used in, uh, in various uh, um, etiologies, whether it is idiopathic or non-idiopathic. And we have the, the uh, we have a lot of literature to prove that it is the best and we are not closing the doors. There are different kinds of treatments which can still apply if the Ponsetti fails. And of course, your examiners knows about it and you should know to pass your exam. So let's talk about who is Ponsetti. He's a son of Spanish watchmaker, born in Minorca, studied in Barcelona and then fled to France from there to Mexico, then to America and he developed the Ponsetti treatment sometime in 1990. So it all, it all uh, depended on this picture. This is called as Ponsetti cadaveric uh, 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 the specimen. So let's talk about a bit about the pathophysiology. So this is the first time Ponsetti has described saying that what, what exactly was the problem apart from the medial structures tightness, posterior uh, structures tightness, what exactly is the patho, uh, 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 pathological problem? So the pathological problem in all uh, arises around the talus. So that the neck of the talus is wrong. 
because of this, the teronavicular joint is uh, dislocated. So the navicular bone is very, very uh, uh, medial. And because of that, there is a pressure from the talus head on the lateral aspect of the navicular, which becomes like a wedge shape. And then the talus will cause pressure on the talus head, which becomes wedge shape again. The cuboid is displaced medially because of the structures very tight on the medial side. Calcaneal cuboid joint is displaced and the calcaneum is inverted and the talus is rotated in the ankle, uh, ankle joint. So if you remember, the talus is abnormal. All around the talus joints are completely deformed because the talus is completely abnormal there. So the Ponsetti method utilizes the normal kinematics of the subtalar joint to, to affect the reduction of the club, uh, club foot deformity. So it is a sequence of different uh, 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 tri uh, tri different stages and uh, it is very precise. Six weeks of manipulations followed by Achilles tendon tenotomy and couple of weeks of uh, again immobilization in the plaster and boots and bars up to the age of four or five there. The indications are fantastic. All types of club feet. You can, you, you can use this Ponsetti uh, for every kind, whether it is idiopathic, post, uh, posteromedial release, arthrogryposis, or any age. Again, contraindications, none. There are no contraindications. You can apply. If it doesn't work, Step uh, go into the next uh, 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 treatment over there. So before we embark on how to treat the talipes with Ponsetti, let's touch base on the scoring system. Pirani has come with a scoring system of uh, uh, six, uh, uh, out of six is severity. So there are three of them for the midfoot, three of them for the uh, hind foot. So let's uh, uh, explore each part of that one there. So he scored from zero to one of every deformity, zero being normal, one being uh, severe deformity. The maximum score you can get is six. So posterior crease, if it is deep, you will get one. If it is medium 0.5, no posterior crease is zero there. Empty heel, if the, if the whole of the heel is uh, empty, you will get one. If it is hard, it is normal, it gets zero. The best way to compare uh, uh, is if you touch your forehead, that is how the uh, zero will be. If you are touching your chin, that is 0.5, that is how it feels. And if you are touching your nose and it is the heel is as soft, the baby's heel is as soft as your tip of the nose, that is one, uh, the score there. Equinus, whether you can get it to 90 degrees, 0.5, you can't get it at all to 90 degrees, it is one over there. Medial crease, depending on the depth of the medial crease and the lateral curvature, how much it is the lateral curvature. If it is really far away from the pencil or a pen which you put on the heel, it is one. If it is touching the lateral surface of the fifth metatarsal is touching your pen, then it is a zero there. Lateral head of the talus, whether it is palpable, easily palpable or hard. If it is easily palpable, uh, that means that it is significantly displaced laterally. So that means it is one. So depending on those three midfoot and hind foot scores, you, 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 you score the patient and the severity. And each time the patient comes into your clinic, you, you again rescore and see whether the uh, foot is improving or not. So Ponsetti method, it is the, uh, there is an order of manip uh, manipulations, which is uh, given the name of CAVE, C-A-V-E. Correct the cavus first stage, abduct the forefoot, hind foot, increase the abduction of the, uh, uh, to correct the hind foot valgus, then correct the equinus by doing the Achilles tenotomy. So this is the first stage. So you are lifting the forefoot to match the hind foot. So that is the supination. This is the difference between the kite and the pawn set. You are aligning the forefoot with the hind foot. This is the normal 
orthopedic principle what we use for fracture reduction or anything over there. The fulcrum is the talus. So here on this left side picture, this the, the green cap of the marker pen is showing where the talus is. That is where your thumb should be there. You do the manipulations, you apply the, the plaster uh, below knee and then you extend it into above knee uh, plaster. Free up the toes over there. Then comes the second. So you do the, again the manipulation, fulcrum is talus and you abed up the forefoot. Again, the, I'm just uh, 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 showing it that the fulcrum is talus. I'm, I'm stressing the point over there. Then comes the third stage, which is correction of the hind foot. This is very, very important. We are not supposed to touch the hind foot. If you, if you touch the calcaneum, the game is over. What we are doing is you control the hind foot by controlling the forefoot. This is called as kinematic coupling of the subtalar joint. So in the right side pictures here, the, the foot, the hind foot is in varus. Without touching the hind foot, by manipulating the forefoot, I am bringing the hind foot into valgus. That's what I am showing here. It, 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 it on the right extreme right picture shows that it is in valgus over there. So this is the natural progression of the uh, the correction. And once the, uh, the, there is no talus felt and the heel varus is corrected, you can attempt doing the tenotomy. The most important thing is you need to have abduction of about 50 degrees and the talus should be completely reduced before you cut the Achilles tendon. Otherwise you will get a rocker bottom foot there. Uh, in my practice and also in Ponsetti, 90% of the pa patients will have the tenotomy and the final cast is ab uh, applied for uh, um, at 70 degrees of abduction and 15 degrees of uh, dorsiflexion. That takes us to the second stage. The second stage is application of boots and bars over there. This is very important to maintain the correction and prevent reoccurrence. There is no substitute. People will come, has given me several excuses saying that, uh, you know, people are, uh, you know, uh, we don't uh, see, uh, uh, see any point of uh, application of boots and bars. The feet are looking better, all kinds of excuses, but there is no substitute for boots and bars. There is again, strict rules. This is like rules written on the stone where 23 hours of uh, 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 boots and bars for three to four months and night and nap time for uh, four years. Now we look at how good is uh, uh, the Ponsetti. We will look at, because of the time reasons, I have picked up only a couple of papers. So this is a paper which is old, 1995. But I, the reason why I have picked up this paper was that this is a 30 years follow up. This is one of the landmark paper for the Ponsetti. What did they do? They compared the patients who has been treated with Ponsetti with a normal patients who, does, who did not have any congenital deformity. So what is the conclusion? The use of pain and functional limitation as an outcome measure, the Ponsetti group of patients were doing nearly as well as the comparison group, which is a normal patients. You can't get more better than these, uh, this study there. Then we have one more paper, recent paper in 2017, meta-analysis, 1,435 patients with nine studies included. They compared the Ponsetti with surg surgery, su surgical treatment, Ponsetti with kite, Ponsetti with French method. So they concluded Ponsetti is, uh, is a safe and efficient with decrease in surgical interventions required. So they recommended Ponsetti as a first choice conservative treatment for idiopathic uh, club foot. So uh, these are the famous uh, people who are uh, the, the uh, who are uh, who has been uh, uh, treated with Ponsetti. So these are the celebrities, and you can see that uh, ice, uh, the Olympic ice skater, uh, American football player, all these people they had they were able to carry on their professional life, and more close to our uh, 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 land is uh, this chap who who had. Ponsetti treatment, he has captained England and he was a football player. So 
it can't be better than uh, this one. So in conclusion, Ponsetti is good, simple, cheap, effective, reliable, reproducible, and got excellent results uh, with the literature support there. So pearls of the success. Head of the talus should be the fulcrum. Calcanium should not be touched over there. So these two pictures are completely wrong. And that is how you need to reduce that one. Cavus correction is deformity. The first stage, the deformity looks worse and don't worry. You reassure the patient, uh, parents there. And supinate the forefoot, don't pronate. This is completely wrong and it will take you to the kites method over there. And when you are doing the tenotomy, if you are thinking that should we do it or should we not, you are not going to lose anything by doing it. That is not at all a problem, but make sure that, that uh, the, the tailor's head is not palpable and there should be 50, uh, 50 degrees of abduction over there. So that will uh, take us to the next topic, rigid flat feet. So we will touch base on vertical talus. So what is vertical talus? It is a rare rigid flat foot disorder. The hind foot is in valgus, equinus, midfoot is in dorsiflexion and forefoot is in abduction. So why is this happening? Because there is a telonavicular joint subluxed or dislocation where the navicular bone is sitting on the neck or head of the talus there. If you compare the CTEV with the congenital vertical talus, in CTEV, that is talipes, uh, club foot, forefoot is plantar flexed, whereas in vertical talus, forefoot is dorsiflexed. There is adductus in talipes, and the, uh, uh, there is abductus in, uh, of uh, midfoot in uh, vertical talus, varus of the hind foot, valgus of the hind foot. The only common thing between the talipes and the vertical talus is equinous deformity, that is, at least tendon is tight. Again, the incidence is one in 10,000, rarer than uh, talipes, unknown etiology, but most of them, 50% of the vertical talus is associated with some kind of neurological problem. So make sure that each and every time you see a vertical talus, rule out neurological problem. Let's go to the pathoanatomy. So what is the position you remember? You imagine the foot in a rocker bottom as a boat shape. So the hind foot is in equinus and then the forefoot is in dorsiflexed. So that means the Achilles tendon is tight. The ankle is uh, uh, lateral valgus. So posterolateral structures are tight and subtalar joint is tight. If the midfoot is completely dorsiflexed, all the tendons in the front of the ankle, tibialis anterior, EHL, EDL, uh, uh, peroneus, they are all tightened. If the, uh, if the telonavicular joint is dislocated, so obviously there is a contracture of the telonavicular joint. So the, the navicular bone sits on the talus and it causes pressure. So obviously it, it is uh, 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 wedged and the navicular bone is uh, hypoplastic. The talus head is pointing down and medially, unlike a CTEV where it is slightly lateral uh, um, uh, directed there. So when the talus is vertically pointed out, so what it does is it takes off the spring ligament. As soon as the spring ligament is uh, uh, gone, then there is no hammock effect underneath. And then the, the, the tightness of the tendons in the front and the back of the ankle will cause the rocker bottom uh, foot. Depending on how severe it is, the calcaneocuboid joint can get dislocated. Then what happens is, interestingly, the tibialis posterior and the peroneal longus and peroneus brevis, which are supposed to be behind the medial and lateral malleolus, because of the deformity, they, they come forward. So the, instead of being the plantar flexors, they become the dorsiflexors over there. So in the physical examination, when you are examining, the hind foot is uh, 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 equinus and valgus as shown on this picture. Forefoot is abducted and dorsiflexed there. So the differential diagnosis is calcaneo valgus. You need to think about whether it is posterior medial bobbing or whether it is the oblique talus. The clue is the hind foot uh, equinus. 
if there is a tightness of Achilles tendon and the hind foot is equinous, that means it has to be a vertical talus over there. Again, I have to re-emphasize, uh, re it is very common to have syndrome. So please refer to the pediatric neuro neurologist. You have to document according to the DOBS, you have to document how the toes are behaving. Whether when you tickle the toes, whether there was any kind of reflexes, flexors or extensors, and you have to make a documentation, whether it was absent, slight, or definite. Because depending on the, on the response, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the vertical talus is, uh, is, is uh, responsiveness. It, it might be resistant to, to be treated, and we might need to opt some op operative treatment there. So there are different kinds of uh, x-rays which we have to take. And one of the important thing is three lateral views, one in neutral, one in plantar flexion, and one in dorsiflexion. There are different lines which are drawn. And one of the important thing is TAMBA, which is Taylor axis first metatarsal basal angle, which should be more, if it is more than 35, it is uh, uh, a vertical talus there. Classification, two types of classification. One is Coleman classification, depending on whether the calcaneal cuboid joint is subluxed or dislocated. Dobbs has said that uh, the, it is, uh, a, a, the Coleman is not giving the prognosis and the motor response of the toe by tickling the toes uh, is much better because you can give the prognosis. If there is no uh, response or slight response, you can think that this is not uh, uh, um, not not an easy vertical talus over there. So what do we do? Again, like a Ponsetti, serial manipulations. Now, the important thing which you need to understand is uh, the, the, the foot has to come into a varus and equinous position. That is what exactly we are bringing the foot from valgus into varus. Once it is there, you need to stabilize the telonavicular joint with a, a small operation followed by Achilles tendon. And the boots and bars are as mentioned on the screen over there. So again, the fulcrum is talus, that is the key landmark. And you push the talus with your finger or thumb up and uh, 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 laterally. Then you bring the rest of the foot on the, on the talus over there. So this is important that the tailor should be pushed dorsally and laterally, and the foot has to be brought into like a first stage of uh, 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 talipes, or when we see the patient first time, how the patient is having plantar, the talipes baby, which is equinous and adducted position. <coughs> so the important thing is, <coughs> please do not touch the calcaneum. Uh, as we do in the, in the talipes. Once we do the re reduction of the telonavicular joint, we, we make a small cut, we confirm that the telonavicular joint is reduced and you pass a K wire holding it in that position. Once the telonavicular joint is reduced, then you do the echelistinotomy so that the foot can be brought to a neutral. Unlike the, uh, the Ponsetti, where you have to place the boots in 70 degrees of external rotation. Here, you need to put it straight. The boots and bars are put straight over there. In Ponsetti, you put the foot in dorsiflexion. That, that is the boots and bars. Here, we put in neutral, no dorsiflexion at all. So the post uh, application of boots and bars, 24 hours, so 23 hours for two months, night and night, nap time for up to four years. If the child starts walking, you can change the boots and bars into a AF4. We need to teach the parents how to do the plantar flexion exercises and adduction to prevent reoccurrence of the, the vertical talus. So the pearls and pitfalls. Talus is again the fulcrum and you need to achieve maximum equinovarus before you do the pillar navicular joint uh, uh, stabilization there. Ensure k wire is centered by direct visualization and Achilles tendon uh, uh, has to be uh, uh, done, tenotomy has to be done only after the reduction of pillar navicular joint there. 
the common errors are pushing the calcanium rather than pushing the uh, uh, pushing the talus and trying to put the wire in teranavicular joint before achieving the maximum equinovarus. That takes us to the tarsal coalition, which uh, which is the final topic. And uh, 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 very quickly going through this, Buffon has first described the tarsal coalition in 1769, and uh, the, uh, it, the first radiological demonstration was done by Kermerson in 1898. That is three years after inventing the X-rays. In 1948, there were, uh, uh, Harrison Thomas has reported that it is a painful, rigid flat foot. So what is the problem? It is a failure of segmentation of the primary mesenchymal. So the coalition will stop the sliding and rotation movement of the subtalar joint, which increases the pressure on the other joints over there. Incidence is about uh, uh, 15, uh, 13 to 15%, sorry, 11 to uh, uh, 15%, and 50% of them are bilateral there. The commonest is calcaneonavicular, and talocalcaneal is the second commonest. These two constitute 90% of tarsal coalitions. There are different types which are mentioned on the screen, but 90% of them are calcaneonavicular and talocalcaneal. It can be classified as whether it is completely osseous, so then we call it as synostosis. If it is cartilaginous, it is called as synchondrosis. If it is a fibrous, it is called as syndesmosis there. What do the patients complain of? Patients complain of pain during any kind of impact activities. The parents complain saying that they, they have uh, the children has flat foot. And these people have repeated ankle sprains. They keep on coming to the accident and emergency. And they also say that they can't walk uh, on uneven floors. And the parents also complain saying that their children are walking like a duck with, with valgus uh, 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 forefoot and midfoot over there. Usually the patients come in the second decade. And the reason is because calcaneal navicular uh, uh, bar ossifies between eight to 12 and talocalcaneal uh, bar ossifies between 12 to 16 years. If, if it is a, a child who has calcaneonavicular bar, they always complain lateral foot pain. If it is uh, talocalcaneal, they usually complain pain on the medial side or um, uh, un under the medial malleus there. So the signs are, uh, the signs are, you know, when you see there is a flat foot, when you ask them to go on tiptoes, the heels are, the, the, the arches are not formed. When you do the jack uh, test, the arch is not formed. And the so subtalar and midfoot can be restricted, difficult on walking on the outer aspect, and you can have double medial malleolus. That is a prominent uh, medial malleolus over there, and there can be peroneal muscle spasm over there. This is not always present. So uh, 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 the, to confuse us, sometimes if you have posterior facet calcaneal, uh, talocalcaneal coalition, you will have a pescavus rather than pes planus there. And when they are doing the tiptoe test and everything, it is not entirely you know, consistent that the arches will be formed. So you can't depend on these things. And then the subtalar and midfoot degree of loss of movement can vary from complete absence to just only slight things. So how do you diagnose? Diagnosis is with high index of suspicion. We do x-rays in calcaneonavicular coalition. You, did, you see the anteater sign, which the original paper, uh, paper says 72% sensitive and 90% specific. And uh, you have a reverse anteater sign, which is if you draw a line on the lateral aspect of the talus, the navicular lateral side should stop. If there is any kind of overhang, that is reverse anteater sign over there. Calcaneo, uh, uh, sorry, talocalcaneal coalition, AP ankle will have a prominent sustentaculum tali. Harris view shows where the talus, uh, uh, talocalcaneal coalition is there. And lateral ankle shows a C sign, which is again sensitive in 49% and specific in 91. Again, this is from the original paper. 
The important thing which we need to understand is that the telocalcanial coalition ossifies roughly around 12 years. So if you are looking for sensitivity, uh, uh, so looking for C-sign on a, a, a young child less than 12 years, that, that is not uh, uh, correct because it's only 5% sensitive. Then you need to look for other indirect signs. If you have any kind of beaking of the talus, if there is any stress fracture of the medial malleus, if, it, if there is any kind of ball and socket joint, if there is hypertroph sorry, hypertrophy of the, of the fibula, then you need to think whether it is some kind of uh, uh, um, tarsal coalition over there. So what do we do? Non-operative treatment, um, uh, which is orthotic art support, walking cast, non-steroidals, and sometimes steroid injection. If they, if they keep on uh, having the problems, then you can do resection, either arthroscopic or open, resection with osteotomy if there is a fixed hind foot valgus, or fusion if there is more than 50% coalition with osteoarthritic changes. Thank you. Thank you very much. What a true tour de force and covering all bases of club foot, virtual talus, coalitions, etc. That was fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Um, there's been a couple of questions come through. Um, and if you guys, if you've got any more, please do put them up on the Q&A section before, we'll, before we move through some case spaces. Um, just going back to kind of the very beginning, really, with club foot, uh, what age do you recommend they start on SETI treatment? So this has to be started as soon as possible, Tim, ideally speaking. So you need to have some kind of protocol. In my hospital, as soon as the patient is uh, uh, seen in, uh, or born um, uh, in, the, in the neonatal ward or in the postnatal ward, and if there is any uh, person, whether it is physio, whether it is uh, midwife, whether it is a uh, 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 junior doctor, thinks that it is a telepiece, I ask them to immediately put them in my next available clinic. So we have created the slots over there because the earlier we see the patient, the better it will be. And I also say that irrespective of whether it is any kind of telepiece or not, if somebody raises a question of telepiece, I want to see them. The reason is I don't mind seeing 100 normal feet, but I don't want to miss that one foot, which they think that it is, uh, uh, which I think that it is a, a positional or calcaneo valgus or something like that. That's a good question here, even on day one. Well, the day one is difficult for me because of the NHS <laughs> thing, but usually within the first two weeks, I'm good, but not that good. <laughs> Okay, and um, uh, leading on from that, there's a question here saying, with your changes of cast, you mentioned you do on a weekly basis, um, is there any, what is the kind of duration if a parent misses an appointment, um, how long they could leave it without affecting the final outcome? Well, this is very interesting. So first and foremost, the reason why I see every patient myself is because you need to educate the parents. It is important. And I start saying that this is going to be eight years treatment the, and it is divided into three sessions. The first session, you need to come every week. If you, uh, uh, the second session, you have to come. We have a protocol of boots and bars and everything. And after that, six months and annually. If they miss the, uh, the day of the clinic, I have a fallback plan there is a direct number to contact the physiotherapist and the plaster technicians, whether I am in the hospital or not, if the parents cannot bring on the day of my clinic, then they will uh, contact uh, the, uh, the plaster technicians. And one of the things which uh, I have developed and everybody has developed is that you need to start the service and have given that reins to one of my physio and, uh, um, sorry, one of my, the Ponseti lead, uh, uh, who is the plaster technician. So the rapport between the parents and the patient, uh, the parents and the uh, uh, Ponsetti Lisi is very good that they will make the arrangements. I don't need to get involved in that one. Do the same rules of starting the age of start, et cetera, apply to congenital vertical talus manipulations as well? Yes, 
it is important that we need to see both of them at the same. Yeah. As a and just to clarify, you mentioned about the Achilles tenotomy at the correct point. Is it, question here, is it a lengthening or is it a complete cut of the Achilles? So the, the, the thing is, it is not a Z lengthening like what you do in a normal Achilles tendon lengthening and everything. This is uh, a, 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 a situation where you are going to make the child scream, not cry, scream for a for couple of minutes. You will make the mother, grandmother, dad, everybody crying. So this is done in outpatient thing. And uh, so it has to be very quick. So what I, what Ponsetti has done is you put the, the, uh, the Achilles tendon under tension and you, you, you nick the, the tendon completely, whereas the sheet is, uh, is uh, intact. So it regrows. And when I started the Ponsetti, when I, when I was doing these things, I was always worried, uh, bloody hell, what is going to happen if it doesn't heal? If it goes into some kind of uh, you know, fibrous thing. But 14 years, I haven't come across anything like that. And having done the tenotomy, do you then position the foot in maximal dorsiflexion? 15 or 15 degrees to 20 degrees. The first one, the first plaster is immediately after the tenotomy is the neutral position. Because when you do the stretching, the, we, we have seen that there is a lot of bleeding. So that's why we put in neutral and then bring them in about three to four days time to the plaster room and 15 degrees of dorsiflexion and leave um, it for two weeks. That's brilliant. Do you do any x-ray monitoring at all of your um, casting or your correction? For, for which one? For club, for club foot. Oh, no, there is no, there is no x-ray unless I have some kind of problem saying that, look, have I done something wrong here? Uh, uh, mm. Have I uh, um, considered a, which is very unlikely, have I, have I considered a Ponsetti treatment for something else or whatever it is, but otherwise I don't. And I have okay. never done it. Question here about congenital vertical talus. After the reduction of the talus navicular joint, for how long do you keep your K wire in and do you bury the wire or leave it percutaneous? Very good question. Six weeks is the straightforward answer for that one. But some people will bury that inside and some people uh, leave it outside. Uh, we usually, uh, 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 I usually, uh, my experience is outside because I can remove it in the, in the clinic. I do not need to take a child to the theater. Brilliant. Well, look, I know you very kindly have brought along some cases and I believe you're registrar to help you go through them. So yeah. now is the perfect time to take over again and carry on if you're happy. Right, okay, so Josh, Hello. Uh, right, so the case number one. So two-day-old child referred to the clinic with query talipes. So we saw the child, and this is the picture what you have. Can you mm -hmm. take me, uh, uh, what, what do you think is the diagnosis here? So uh, it doesn't look like talipes. It's going the other way. So obviously with the limitations of 2D photograph, it looks like the heel would be going to valgus rather than varus. Uh, the forefoot, it looks like it's abducted as well. So uh, it do doesn't look like talipes. I think the two things I'd be concerned about more likely is a, is a calcanea valgus, um, but I'd want to examine and rule out uh, congenital vertical talus. Fantastic. So how do you differentiate? Uh, we'll come to the vertical talus uh, uh, next like uh, in, in the later on, how do you differentiate whether it is uh, calcaneo valgus or CTEV? I know that you have touch based mm -hmm. some of them already. So uh, as you mentioned earlier with uh, CTEV, you'll have a, a cavus foot, you'll have a, uh, a ductus as well, um, varus deformity and a, quine, and a fixed rigid equinus uh, Very good. with tightness. So that would be uh, talipes, but in calcaneo valgus, it should be flexible rather than rigid um, yeah. and uh, the hind foot <coughs> hind foot would be uh, <coughs> everted and dorsiflexed very good so uh,
So this is calcaneo valgus. We need to rule out uh, vertical talus and um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, calcaneo valgus is a package disorder. So you need to make sure that the D, you rule out the DDH and make sure that you have a plantar flexion. When the foot is like that for nine months in the, in the mom's uh, tummy, they might not be having plantar flexion. So if you need to see whether there is a plantar flexion or not, if there is no plantar flexion, you can apply a couple of plasters over there. Always, if in doubt, this is what uh, uh, Tim, which you are saying, if there is in doubt, then this is where I do the X-ray between the calcaneo valgus and vertical talus. And I reassure uh, about the self-limiting condition uh, and uh, demonstrate the stretching exercises over there. That is calcaneo valgus. Okay, let's go to case number two. 16 month old child presented to the clinic with a foot deformity. So we see that this is the foot. Mm -hmm. What is the diagnosis, uh, Josh? So it looks like metatarsus adductus. Um, there's a convex border laterally and uh, forefoot is adducted. Very good. Do you know any kind of classification? Um, if it's flexible or if it's rigid good. and also you can use the heel bisector line as to um, what's normal, mild, moderate, severe. Okay. So I think normal would be going through the second and third toe web space and yeah. more laterally is more severe. So what do you think? How should we treat this one? So uh, I guess you could examine the patient, see if it's actively or passively correctable or if it's rigid. Um, but the vast majority of patients, you can either just observe it or teach the parents uh, to some stretching exercises. Brilliant. Okay. So this is positional again, like calcaneo valgus, uh, more common in the primaries, uh, petite moms and big children, diabetic, uh, gest gestational diabetes, because they have big babies. 90% of them are self-limiting. They correct by the age of four years there. Uh, Okay, and the important thing is you need to rule out the talipes. Again, the package disorder, think about the uh, hip because you don't want to miss a hip dislocation uh, um, uh, with calcaneo valgus. There is 20% metatarsal adductus and everything. There is 20% chance of DDH there. As you have mentioned, depending on the heel bisector line, whether it is going through the third toe between the third and fourth toe or fourth and fifth toe, it is classified into mild, moderate, and severe. Mild is parent stretching, moderate is straight uh, last shoes. Uh, so there are some special shoes which has straight uh, medial border. And in uh, uh, previously, when I was registrar and uh, uh, SHO, we used to ask the parents to use the opposite shoes, wear the opposite shoes, because that will stretch the medial side. In severe uh, cases, serial casting or operative correction over there. Okay, let's go to third case. 14 year old girl complaining of pain and lump in the foot. Patient, history of uh, pain on wearing shoes. And uh, on examination, there is flexible uh, uh, flat feet. So this is the picture which is on, uh, on the examination table. What do you see, uh, Josh? So yeah, as you mentioned, um, it appears to be a flat foot. Um, it's difficult to say. I didn't. Well, I didn't. Yeah. Don't know where the lump is. So that I, lump is over uh, here. So uh, that's it's around. Projected about, well. Sorry. Yeah. So it doesn't look tail, probably navicular region. Okay. What could be the commonest cause of that lump? Um, I guess, well, you need an x-ray to confirm it, but... That's the x-ray. Okay. Yeah, so it looks like uh, there's uh, an, ex an, an accessory navicular. Fantastic. Uh, okay. Grade three. That's the diagnosis there. Do you know any classification, Josh, of accessory navicular? I don't know the name, but uh, it's out of three stages and depend. the first stage is like a sesamoid. Uh, in the uh, posterior tibialis tendon, the second stage is uh, uh, attached to the navicular by like a syn synchondrosis or 
or synostosis or synostosis, not synostosis, synchondrosis. And then the third is an enlargement of the uh, navicular medially. Right. Okay. So that's the, do you know anything about the treatment? How do we treat this uh, thing? I guess it, it's, it's quite common and often is asymptomatic. So if, uh, if the patient is symptomatic, it would be activity modification, uh, shoe wear modification. If she has a prominence there, some padding around that area. I think that would probably suffice for most patients. Um, but if, you know, this is all uh, ineffective, non-operative treatments, possibly excision, but that would be down the line. Yeah, so that is the excision which we do sometimes. Uh, we can reattach the tibialis posterior and tighten the tibialis posterior, or sometimes you shell the accessory navicular out of that one there. Okay, next case is 15-year-old ballet dancer complaining of pain in the ankle, would like to be a professional ballet dancer, points out the pain in the back of the ankle, like what's shown on the uh, picture. What, um, what do you think is happening? I think the history is quite classical. Um, if she's getting the pain when she's a ballet dancer, if she's plantar flexing the ankle, uh, it's unlikely to be an Achilles um, pathology in a 15 year old, um, but possibly, yeah, well, similarly an X-ray would be useful. Yeah, so um, she's pointing, <laughs> pain on pointing. So we will give the X-ray, this is the X-ray. So uh, there is an ostrigonum there. Otherwise, uh, it looks relatively normal. Okay. So what is the diagnosis then? So if it's pain on plantar flexion, it could be ostrigonum syndrome. Yeah. Which is from the history, ballet dancers, symptomatic is the giveaway. So you do the uh, MRI scan and you can clearly see that uh, uh, there is some signal change in the posterior aspect of the, uh, uh, of the uh, ankle there. And uh, uh, the diagnosis is confirmed by history, like what you have said, and examination. And the treatment is, you know, avoiding the hyper uh, 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 plantar flexion movements, physiotherapy, and confirmation. Sometimes you give the injections to uh, uh, diagnose as well as to treat and if it is uh, uh, painful and if they want to continue as a professional ballet, arthroscopic or open excision. We used to do open excision, but nowadays we are doing arthroscopic excision. So that is me, uh, Tim. That was brilliant. And more importantly, thank you, Joshua. I thought he did very well there indeed under the, uh, under the pressure of a large audience. Well done, Josh, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, he did very well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Krishna, that was brilliant. Uh, what a great session and a real run through of pediatric um, foot and ankle and important ones for the exam. And there's some great cases at the end. Um, just for the guys who um, who are, are listening, your the feedback code is in that chat. And any moment now when we end, we'll pop up the QR code you can use to also get uh, the feedback code. So be ready for that. Um, next week, there is a lecture on... Um, on Pez Cavus by the guys from Stanmore in London. Again, last year that went down extremely well. And this year they're gonna be looking at cases, looking at case discussions again, hopefully involving the registrar. So hopefully once again, really worth joining in and do look forward to that. But finally, once again, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Mr. Ben Malapalli for giving up his time and pre presenting tonight's lecture of distinction. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you. of Ramsey here in the UK.
Ramsey Healthcare is a global provider of healthcare. Uh, we operate in 11 countries, employing 77,000 staff, and incredibly, we look after over 8 million patients a year. Ramsey Healthcare has been here in the UK for the last 12 years. We've now become the number one provider for NHS services, which means that GPs are able to choose Ramsey Hospitals to refer their patients for high quality healthcare. So Ramsey has got a long-standing set of values called the Ramsey Way. They really define who we are as an organisation, how we work together, how we look after patients, and ultimately it's all about people caring for people. We're very proud of the services that we provide, and that's largely due to teamwork and our staff. The difference that this makes for patients is really high quality healthcare in all of our hospitals and facilities. We've got an absolutely fantastic programme called Speaking Up for Safety. It's all about training staff to be positive and to call out episodes in patients' care, particularly when they're concerned that things aren't going right. We've been able to grab this programme and we're the first organisation in the UK to roll this programme out. The future for Ramsey Healthcare is bright both globally and for us here in the UK. All of our units are accredited for endoscopy. The Care Quality Commission has rated 92% of our hospitals as good and 95% of our patients would recommend us to their friends and family. We're a leader in day case surgery. We've looked at the way that our hospitals are designed so that we can treat ever more patients in today's healthcare. The future of healthcare is all about partnerships and integrating the patient journey. At Ramsey, this means we need to be working very closely with all our partners, including the NHS, to make sure that our services are available in all the communities that our hospitals serve. Over time, I can see the company both growing and expanding in the reach of its services. But for me, most of all, patient safety and quality come first. Simply put, people caring for people.